Good afternoon. Welcome to our Rotary Luncheon. My name is Carrie Aiken, and I serve as the club's president. This year's theme is Imagine Rotary. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Rotary Club of Evansville. As Rotarians, we try daily to live by the four-way test in all the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerns? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Please join me in pledging allegiance to our flag in our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen Johnson will now come forward to for, to lead us in prayer. Good morning. I'd like to share with you a beautiful piece entitled, All That We Share Is Sacred by Andre Moll. As we gather together, may we remember, when you share with me what is most important to you, that is where listening begins. When I show you that I hear you, when I say your life matters, that is where compassion begins. When I open the door to greet you, that is where hospitality begins. When I venture out to bring you to shelter, that is where love begins. When I risk my comfort to ease your suffering, when I act against hatred, violence, and injustice, that is where courage begins. When we experience the full presence of each other because of our shared humanity, because of our differences, that is where holy gratitude begins. May this today be a space of beauty where together we create a series of miracles and where all that we share is sacred. Amen. Thank you, Karen. You may all be seated. I'd like to thank EREP and the mayor's office for purchasing tables and supporting our program today. On behalf of Evansville Rotary, I would like to extend my appreciation to all the men and women here today for their dedication and service to our community. We are honored once again that Mayor Lloyd Wenicke has chosen the Rotary Club of Evansville's new luncheon as the venue to present the State of the City Address. Would all Rotarians please stand in honor of our guests today? Show our appreciation. Thank you. I'm told that the mayor's office staff created a very special video to introduce Mayor Winnicky this year. Mayor Winnicky, please come forward to present the State of the City Address. Mayor Lloyd Winnicky currently serves as the 34th mayor of the great city of Evansville. An Evansville native, he has spent his professional and political career supporting everyone who works to help our community 
grow, and prosper. Join us as we explore the life and legacy of Mayor Lloyd Winicky. It was a cloudy, cool day on June 6, 1960. So, whose idea was that? Yeah, that was, uh, something. Goofy. Yeah, Goofy. Look, you already know the intro. Yeah, he's been mayor of Evansville for over 10 years. All you really need to know is he is the most caring and dedicated mayor. And the most dedicated and caring pop-ups. Now please join us in welcoming our pop-ups and your mayor, Lloyd Winicky. Thank you. Okay, we did not go over that in rehearsal today. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I talked to Oliver and Holden this weekend and they kept the secret. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you to present my 12th and final State of the City speech. Know that I am grateful to the Rotary Club of Evansville for this opportunity and for the amazing support during my time in office. Preparing for today, I've been thinking a lot about Evansville's history. The city's birthday was just last Monday, and, and that reminded me that our city's founder, Hugh McGarry, walked to Vincennes to purchase the original 440 acres of what would become Evansville. Today, most of us wouldn't dream of making that walk to Vincennes. Instead, the greater Evansville region is working on a transformational project, a $1.4 billion bridge over the Ohio River, the river by which Hugh McGarry arrived. I've been thinking about our 19th mayor, Benjamin Bossie, arguably our city's most effective mayor. He coined the phrase, when everybody boosts, everybody wins. What a legacy saying. I like to think that our E is for Everyone campaign is a modern day equivalent to Mayor's Bossy, Mayor Bossy's encouragement for us to boost. Every success over the last year, actually over the last 11 plus years, is the result of individuals and organizations boosting toward a common goal. My most important booster is my wife Carol, one of your fellow Rotarians. This work, that of leading the city, requires a fully committed partner, and I have that and so much more in Carol. Carol's kept me grounded, focused on what really matters, make sure I don't get too high or too low, always there with a caring heart, sharing the same goal, making the city of Evansville the best it can be each and every day. I love you. We have a lot of other boosters here today, men and women who work for the city of Evansville and they oversee or work in departments that provide key services to the city. If you work for the city of Evansville, would you please stand to be recognized? As with every evaluation of our city, I have achievement, pride, challenge, and opportunity to share with you. In last year's State of the City, we detailed the National Safe Communities Initiative. This is an effort to reduce violent group crime. All responding law enforcement agencies gather for a shooting review following any shooting in which group activity is suspected. These reviews give investigators the chance to exchange information so that group members can be clearly identified. Then there's an intervention with suspected group members, stressing that violence is unacceptable, that their families need them alive, out of prison, contributing to the community while also offering potential solutions to stop their criminal activity. In 2021, there were 12 murders attributed to group violence. Last year, there were only five linked to group violence. 
EPD, along with community partners, delivered 40 custom notifications or interventions last year. In total, EPD reports 30 fewer group or gang-related crimes in 2022 over 2021. We believe that the combination of the shooting reviews and the direct communication with those suspected of group violence is starting to make a difference. To be clear, this is not a statement of victory. It's an observation of some achievement and evidence that more work lies ahead. Staffing is a law enforcement challenge here, as with just about every police agency in the country. More and more officers are changing careers or opting for early retirement, and there are significant fewer applicants today than there were just a few years ago. It's understandable given the danger and the scrutiny of the profession. While we do have openings in the department, you need to know that we've never reduced staff, and we have always found opportunities to increase our police budget. In fact, we're always looking for means by which to make even greater investment year after year. I'd like to talk about January 19th. It was a Thursday. You may not remember the significance of that date, but you will when I say Walmart shooting. I met Chief Billy Bolin at EPD headquarters about 45 minutes after the first 911 call. Thanks to our city's investment in technology, we were able to view chilling body camera video before officers even returned to headquarters. What I witnessed affirmed what I've already knew to be true, and it's important for our city to recognize. We have an extraordinary police department, trained and ready for the unthinkable. The video that you're about to see is dramatic. Its intent is to stress the reality of what police face and to show the state of their preparedness. Mayor Lloyd Winicky currently Evansville 911. We're at Westside Walmart. There's an active shooter. Active shooter 911. Okay. Oh my God. How many shooters are there? One shooter. Okay. Are you in the, the Westside Walmart? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma All right. right. How many shots have been fired? One. He shot a girl in the head. He shot, shot in the head? head. I huh? think they ran out in towards the store. Okay. Has shot someone in the head? Yes, the girl shot in the head. I'm pretty sure she got shot in the head. Okay. Okay. Um, we got him on the way, okay? All cars, be advised. Shots fired. Active shooter. 335 South Red Bank, Walmart West. The large black male, Roder Mosley. Multiple people down at this time, 335 South Red Bank. So when dispatch comes over the radio, you could tell there was a little bit of a different tone in their voice when they started dispatching it, and then there was a pause. Couldn't tell you how long the pause was. And then it was all cars start towards Walmart West for an active shooter. Aaron, talk about uh, the Walmart shooting night. Where were you when the first when you heard the first dispatch? I was actually on another run when the first dispatch came out. It was just a report run, pretty typical. We have the city divided into sectors, and those sectors are divided into beats. Uh, Walmart West is actually in my beat, so I'm pretty close to Walmart West. I think I was there in about two minutes. Pulled in the front. There were. I was one of the first cars in the lot. There were starting to be some other cars. Um, I had heard another officer call out that he was going inside. You were working off duty that night. Yes, um, I was working off duty. I was at Deaconess Hospital and had my radio on. I heard the all call come across. They said all units be advised to active shooter Walmart West, which is something you don't hear. So when you got there, walk us through everything that you did and everything that you experienced. Um, just walked in the front door. It was quiet didn't really see any people which was a surprise for me you know you think active shooter you expect to see people running victims hearing shots weren't seeing any of that so i guess kind of got in a group of people that started working our way to the back and then once we got inside it was just eerily quiet there was nothing no yelling no shots nothing on the radio it was kind of weird to hear how loud the overhead music was and that plays the muzak in the background on the on the overhead um didn't have any 
anywhere to go, so we just kind of formed up and started clearing the building. And as we pull into the parking lot, there is a, there's several cars parked in front of the grocery side of it, but there was zero cars parked in front of the pharmacy side, so my partner and I, we were like, hey, the door's open, let's go in this door. I'm on you. So you start working your way through, did you encounter the suspect? It was a while before, uh, you know, hindsight being 2020, we now know that once we got in the building, he kind of started hiding from us. So um, it, it was a while before we um, actually had contact with him. And then where were you when that encounter occurred? I was close to electronics. I had gotten to a, a kind of form another group of people. We were getting ready to push um, kind of east through the store. Um, I was out in an aisle, and at that point he shot at myself and, and the group that I was in. So we start that way um, because during our training of active shooter, you know, once you hear shots, you go towards the shots, you go towards the threat. You hear a shot, that's a threat because our number one goal is preserving life in a situation like that. Make sure we keep guys on this door. As we're moving closer to the where the electronics area, we heard some, some gunshots closer to us and then we found out that's where he went out an exit door, engaged some officers that were outside, and then came back inside, and then that's where we encountered him. I have a shield, does anybody need? Over here. The shooting stopped and they advised he's down, so I pushed up to where the suspect was on the ground, still armed with a handgun in his hand. There was a second engagement, and then the threat was stopped at that point. Hold fire! And the suspect would have thrown down the gun and put his hands up. He would have been taken into custody, but he still had the gun. As we moved closer, he's firing off more shots, so that's a deadly force situation at that time. So. The officers did what they had to do, um, engage the suspect, and then um, stop the threat. I couldn't be prouder to, to be you know, part of this community and the law enforcement community here in Evansville. I think everybody performed very, very well. Um, we always try to go back and pick apart, you know, part of SWAT, we debrief everything and look at what could we have done better, or what could we have done differently. But I think everybody, you know, performed outstanding that night and went to work and didn't hesitate to go inside and, you know, protect the citizens of Evansville. Also charged with protecting the citizens of Evansville, the Evansville Fire Department. This team of professionals, like their law enforcement counterparts, also develop a deep bond with coworkers. They essentially, essentially spend a third of their lives with fellow firefighters. August 10th, 2022 was a Monday. It was a green shift duty day, one of three work shift designations for the Evansville Fire Department. The crew at Hose House 4 on Oak Hill Road had experienced a fairly normal day until about one o'clock that afternoon. That's when their station house was rocked by an explosion right around the corner. Not knowing what happened, Captain Mike Whitledge and his crew instinctively jumped on their engine and rolled out of the station toward the debris field. They arrived on scene less than a minute after the blast. I'm alone. We need help, quick. I th there's been a massive explosion. Oh my God, a house just blew up on one box. Another one. Hey, there's been an explosion right off the corner of Oak Hill and Weinbach. Something just blew to high heaven, dude. I'm not lying. No, there's got to be people hurt. There's okay. House completely apart. I'm okay. a 1011 Hercules. I hear an ambulance. They're need a on lot their way. They're on their way. We need a lot of help now. What? They're on their way. Let's go back to that date uh, in August. What was happening in the fire station? In August, just a typical August day, we had the front door open. Uh, it was still fairly early in the morning, and we were uh, kind of going through our workout chore kind of schedule. And as soon as I opened the door, the concussion kind of came across me. 
one of my thoughts immediately was, okay, was this an explosion? Was this an isolated explosion? Was this possible terrorist attack? You know, there's a hundred different things that could possibly have happened. At that point, you know, obviously we knew we had to go to work. We uh, jumped on the truck as soon as we could and, and got moving. You got there so fast and you made it sound like it took a while, but you got there inside of a minute. I have been told 45 seconds. We, we self-dispatched. We didn't wait for the tones to come off. This is something very obvious. The entire house shook. We had some minor damage here at the station, so it was it was very obvious to us that it's, it's what we trained for, go to work. With this, when we pulled up, I just remember thinking, where's the house? Dispatch, one engine four is on scene. We have a complete demolished house. Immediately when we pulled up, I noticed that there was no active fire or very, very little. I think there was just a couple of things that were still smoldering. So we knew that the fire emergency was over. We were pretty confident, 80% confident, that the major source of danger, you know, had passed, that it was an explosion, and, and we didn't have to really worry about any other dangers. So then we automatically go to life safety mode, and um, we're looking for any casualties, and, and it's really a triage situation. We didn't know if there were 10 people, we didn't know if there were 30 people, or if there was one person. We didn't know if there was any people. Uh, immediately as we pulled up, we noticed that there were people present and injured, uh, so we went into life safety mode and, and grabbed our medic bag and, and started that route. Engine 4 is assuming command. We're doing a 360 of the house, looking for explosion victims on the outside. We have one out front on the front porch. Make that two. We have at least two in the front yard. I was here probably 45 minutes after the explosion, and what I saw was this great choreography, if you will, of, of firefighters doing their work. How do you train for that? Well, obviously you can't blow a house up and train it, so your training is, is mostly discussion uh, with your crew. It can be discussion with your chiefs. It can be something a little more formal uh, through a class, you know, as, as we work our way up through the ranks. There's a number of classes that we take to make sure that our skills are up to snuff. Uh, we know it's a team sport, essentially. Firefighting is very crew related. So we start to divide the work up and determine what needs to be done and it works its way through that whole process. What do you want the citizens of Evansville to know about how well prepared this department is to handle disaster? I think the experiences, you know, speak for themselves. Uh, as far as the explosion goes, you know, we had an entire lineup of trucks there, guys ready to work. We worked for over eight hours. Uh, we had the equipment that we needed. We got it here very fast. Everyone was deployed quickly, swiftly, and we had multiple agencies. I think in one day we had eight or ten agencies in here, and they were all working together what appeared to me to be seamlessly. I think we have one of the best training departments that I can think of. I know that our facilities that we have to train in, the burn chamber that we get to use, the maze that we get to use, the, the five-story structure that we have, and just the quality of um, instructors that we have. They help us try and think on our feet and adapt to any situation that we may come to. I would like the citizens of Evansville to understand that their public safety employees are some of the best trained, most caring people they know. I want them to know that when they call 911, someone is gonna show up and start making things better. They're, they're seeing perhaps the worst day of their life and now you've got a friendly face saying, hey, we got this, we'll take care of it. Sadly, three of our fellow residents died from that explosion. As I met with tearful neighbors that afternoon along Weinbach Avenue, they thanked me for the timely professional response of the Evansville Fire Department. Another part of the team of top-notch first responders, equally prepared for disasters of all kind, are dispatchers. They take our calls when we dial 911, and they work to ensure police, fire, paramedics arrive on scene as quickly as possible, like they did the night of the Walmart shooting, the day of the house explosion, and for two of our city's largest ever fires, October 17th and December 31st. I had never seen anything of that magnitude. That day, they were on multiple channels. 
they had a front scene, they had a back scene in trying to keep up with everyone. I needed the help from the whole room to help me that day. I don't think you have time to think in that type of type of situation. Our training kicks in and um, you just you just do your job. We are moving fire trucks from one station to another station. This day, we utilized all volunteer fire agencies. I have never encountered that. They got tankers from outlying counties to bring in shuttle and water. The houses that were south of the burning area, it was melting the siding on their houses. So then they had to get to those homes. So now we have even a bigger area of this fire the impact it is, much less saving these businesses. So, affecting a lot of people's lives and livelihood. I have never experienced that in my 30 years of being here. It was pretty impressive how they all worked together. I'm very proud of the work that I do, the people I work with, and I think we really are one of the best of the best around here with all the first responders in our community here in Evansville. Let me be clear, we have remarkably skilled public safety agencies, each of which performs at exceptional levels in the most dangerous and highly scrutinized situations. Our Our first responders are also on the front line of another serious issue, drug overdoses. Fentanyl and other opioids are at the heart of many overdoses. Sadly, Evansville is not immune from this national crisis. 77 people died in our community last year from drug overdoses. How can we make a difference? How do we make a difference and reduce that number? We think one way is through a creative new partnership between Youth First and Forefront Therapy. Perry Black, Wade Lohorn, Ryan and Jessica Wood represent these fine organizations and are with us today. They and others have over the past many months been in discussions on the best and most effective use of $3.4 million in opioid settle settlement funds the city will receive over the next 17 years. As a result, I'm pleased to announce that we will ask City Council to fund important initiatives developed by Youth First and Forefront, all of which qualify for matching dollars from the state of Indiana and to which I've already signed letters of support seeking those funds. Youth First and Forefront will collaborate on a plan which will allow the two groups to expand their respective outstanding evidence-based services to in-school an outpatient therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and social work services. This collaboration will enable Youth First to recruit and retain a strong workforce of highly proficient social workers who are specialized mentor for thousands of young people and their families. For its part, the Forefront team has created a multidisciplinary program for chronic pain to avoid opioid use and to assist those already addicted to opioids with treatment that is opioid-free. Another piece of this effort is specialized training to bolster the expertise in providing service to babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome as well as to mothers battling addiction. Youth First and Forefront will also build a provider symposium so that other experts in this space can develop new strategies and grow capacity to combat the opioid epidemic. The willingness of these two fine organizations to collaborate is very impressive, and I'm confident that they are worthy of our encouragement and financial support. Well, if we were going to assign a color to the first part of the speech, I think it would be red, so we're gonna change color schemes a little bit now, and we're gonna go to orange. I'm exceptionally proud of our administration's commitment to infrastructure. Investment in this space is a sign of progress and, of course, of some inconvenience. 
Phase two of the Walnut Street connector is about 50% complete. This portion of the protected path extends east from Weinbach to Van Avenue, continues north on Van, and ties into the pedestrian bridge over the expressway towards Roberts Park. We anticipate completion of this section this year. Project three of this, phase three of this project from US 41 to Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard recently received good news. Despite a very challenging bidding environment, bids came in under engineer's estimates. We expect portions of this stretch to go under construction early this summer. The entire corridor will be done in 2025. When finished, the Walnut Street Connector will deliver on the original promises of the Regional Cities Award and the Welburn Baptist Foundation Grant, a multimodal corridor connecting downtown, beginning at the medical school, east through the University of Evansville campus to the State Hospital, Roberts Park, and Wesselman Park. This will really improve our city's quality of life and dramatically upgrade our connectivity. Inter infrastructure investment is also about public safety. No b project better illustrates this project, th this point rather, than the pedestrian bridge over US 41 at Washington Avenue. Governor Holcomb joined me at this site in 2019 and saw firsthand the dangers of this intersection. This visit spurred transportation planners into action. Of course, there were COVID delays, but today final design work is nearly complete and the project will go to bid in May. Assuming bids are within budget, utility relocation and, cons and construction will begin this summer on this much anticipated overpass with accompanying redesigned left turn movements on Highway 41, it will greatly improve safety at this troubled and dangerous intersection. Speaking of troubled intersections, the state reports that the Lloyd Expressway upgrades are nearing final design. This collection of improvements is known as the Lloyd for You and includes upgrades from the Posey County line to the Warwick County line, 17 individual projects in all. The state plans intersection improvements at Cross Point, Burkhart, Stockwell, Van, Wabash, St. Joe, and Rosenberger. In addition, the state will completely replace the pavement on the expressway starting at Wabash Avenue west to the Posey County line. These projects represent a total investment by the state of $150 million. This is money NDOT could spend anywhere in Indiana but leaders understand the need for improved traffic flow and safety on the Lloyd Expressway. The first contract is expected to be advertised for bid late this year with construction set to start in 2024 with modifications and reconstruction at intersections of Van and Stockwell. The intersections at Burkhardt and Cross Point will be rebuilt in 2025. Engineers are still working on the exact sequencing for the West Side project. So, be prepared, orange barrels, cones galore, beginning in 2024. Be ready for the delays and all that come with major road projects. I urge you to exercise caution and patience in these work zones and know when that it's done, the Lloyd Expressway will have significantly safer traffic flow through the city. While I have you deep in the mindset of infrastructure, it's also important to apprise you of the latest developments within the Evansville Water and Sewer Utility. Allow me to begin with the status of the new water treatment plant, which will replace our current facility that opened in 1897. Here's a rendering of the new facility, which will be constructed at the site of the current street maintenance garage and levy authority facility at Waterworks Road and Veterans Memorial Parkway. Engineers recommended the new plant be constructed as close to the river as possible. They said for every mile a new plant was away from the river, we should anticipate an additional $15 million in cost. A majority of this design work is complete, and we anticipate having a final fixed price in the coming weeks. To make room for the new treatment plant, we are relocating the street maintenance garage to city-owned land adjacent to the county jail. We anticipate construction on it to be complete in about a year. The levy authority will also move to city-owned land, this time on Stanley Avenue, also on the city's north side. We expect that new facility to be opened next May. Well, if you drive downtown at all, 
we are all aware of the traffic disruption caused by the Toyota Trinity Stormwater Park. This is a project first pitched as part of the University of Evansville Changemaker Challenge by then Bossy High School senior Robert Lopez. Robert is now a UE senior. This is a really important project because it will remove 20 mil 26 million gallons of stormwater from our system every year. We are also replacing 4,700 feet of water lines with this project. And because of supply chain issues, we now anticipate completion of this project later this year. We continue to work on our integrated overflow control plan. You will recall that we agreed to a $729 million plan with US EPA and Department of Justice back in 2016 to reduce the number of combined sewer over overflows. In 2018, we asked to renegotiate that deal because prices on the first set of projects came in significantly higher than engineers' estimates. Our efforts led to a five-year pause of plan implementation with federal and state regulators, which has produced a three-year stretch of no sewer rate increases. We are, however, still obligated, obligated to complete specific projects not in the integrated overflow control plan, such as the construction of a new lift station at Wandsford Yards on the north side. We do anticipate sewer rate increases beginning in 2024 to fund that project. We'll propose a new, more affordable, long-term control plan to our federal partners by the end of this year and use the final two years of the five-year pause to negotiate a final deal. I'm pleased to announce that one of our utility projects, which also creates a wonderful riverfront amenity, is about to open. The Cascade of the Sunrise Pump Station and the Greenway near the Cascade will open April 17th. The pump station was built as part of the East Water Treatment Plant expansion, and the Cascade is the means by which we return treated water back into the Ohio River. The Utility Department is the one city department on which every city citizen relies daily. It handles our sewage and produces water at crazy levels, all part of the day-to-day -day operation of our city government. The city, engineering. the city engineering department replaced 96 curb ramps, resurfaced 20 lane miles, and secured a $987,000 grant for additional street paving in 2023. When Evansville needed them most, the Evansville Fire Department was there answering 10,563 calls for service, extinguishing 226 working fires and responding to 5,570 emergency medical service calls. The Evansville Police Department responded to 141,619 calls for service, certified 129 crisis intervention team officers and took 577 illegal guns off the street. While Central Dispatch answered 146,000 calls for service in 2022. The Evansville Water and Sewer Utility produced 7.9 billion gallons of water from our treatment plant, replaced 105 fire hydrants, cleaned 81 miles of sewer mains, and repaired 273 water main breaks. That's a 25% decrease from 2021. The Levy Authority pumped over 5 million gallons of rainwater from our city storm sewers to the Ohio River during flood events. From the Transportation and Services Department, street maintenance crews filled 8,839 potholes. METS ridership increased by 13% year over year and Animal Control transferred 960 pets to rescues. ADA functionality was added to the government's webpage to better serve our community thanks to computer services. And the Department of Metropolitan Development was busy breaking ground for 54 affordable housing units, providing free Wi-Fi to 1,500 users each month thanks to a partnership with the Promise Zone and the EVSC and approving 40 small business loans totaling over $1.7 million to help fund commercial businesses and create jobs. 
while Mesker Park Zoo and Botanic Garden welcomed 205,766 visitors, a new record. And they reached new heights with 2,025 unique educational programs that 240,000 community members attended. The Deaconess Aquatic Center was a big splash thanks to the Evansville Parks and Recreation Department with 3,569,720 laps completed. 25 college swim team competitions were hosted at the Lily King Competition Pool and 40 community swims were held. Impressive work by the city's 1,200 plus employees. Okay, here are five other impressive numbers. 23, 15,000, 30 million, 32 and a half million, 62 and a half million. 15,000 residents living in 12 economically challenged census tracts over the next five years will benefit from a $30 million Department of Education grant to the University of Evansville to create the Evansville Promise Zone. With UE as the lead partner, 23 other, lead, 23 other agencies will provide an additional $32.5 million in matching funds, mainly through in-kind services over that five-year period. The $62.5 million investment will offer wraparound family and community support systems, assist children in this neighborhood to achieve academic excellence, help them transition to a post-secondary education, and ultimately help them embark on a career. The Promise neighborhood includes Evans Elementary, Delaware, Lincoln, Lodge Community School, Glenwood Leadership Academy, and Bossy High School. The grant is one of only three such awards in the entire country. A special thank you to UE President Chris Petroskevich, EVSC Superintendent Dr. David Smith, EREP CEO Tara Barney, the Promise Zone Silas Matcham, and many other community partners who came together in a collaborative spirit that is uniquely Evansville. Evansville's unique riverfront will soon be home to a new project which will be the largest of its kind in the entire state, the Sunset Skate Park. Site, is under, site work is underway there now, which is between the Sunrise Pump Station and Mickey's Kingdom. The skate park will feature artwork, jumps for serious skaters, and even a cycle track for skaters and those learning to ride a bike. The design truly has something for everyone. We anticipate completion this fall. No doubt you've heard about our plans to build pickleball courts. <laughs> adjacent to the tennis courts at Wesselman Park. Pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the country and if you don't play it, chances are you know someone who does. When local pickleball enthusiast Michael Watkins first pitched the idea of new courts back in 2021, we quickly learned that residents all over the city play in church and school gyms, fitness centers, community buildings, and tennis facilities. The Parks Department, with extensive input from the Wesselman Wood staff, Visit Evansville, and others, developed a plan to provide courts free to the public while also positioning the city to host state and regional tournaments. Like many projects, initial bids came in over budget, so we have to adjust the project scope to fit our funding. As a result, 16 courts are proposed, and we hope to begin construction later this spring. Evansville is blessed to have iconic parks and have great, that have great historic and sentimental significance. Garvin and Wesselman are two such parks, and it's time we make new investments in each of those. Wesselman Park will benefit from our partnership with Wesselman Woods, the 200-acre hardwood forest. Back in 2020, we committed to grant the land, which formerly was home to the Par 3 golf course, to Wesselman Woods for the purpose of reforestation. This collaboration will expand the nature preserve by 32 acres. We are equally excited by Wesselman Woods' long-term plan to build a new visitor center near that reforested area in order to bring increased visibility and awareness to their programs. And what better way to begin restoring Wesselman than by completely renovating the entrance? 
Work is underway to create a safer, more attractive front door to the park on Bakey Road. This new entrance will benefit walkers, runners, motorists, and most importantly, create a better connection to the neighborhood around the park. The revised master plan for Wesselman and Roberts Park envisions designated walking and running paths, new basketball and sand volleyball, volleyball courts, a parkour or ninja type course, slower traffic, relocation and creating a new destination playground, all in addition to connecting to the former location of Roberts Stadium. We remain committed to a large festive lawn at Roberts Park along with a new lake to the south, a pavilion, restrooms, and hundreds of new trees which are in addition to the reforested area that I just referenced. One of the motivations behind this design is the opportunity to create connected green space from Morgan Avenue to the north all the way through Wesselman Park, Roberts Park, across the Lloyd Expressway via the pedestrian bridge, through the state hospital grounds to Lincoln Avenue. The trail system that will be created will connect with the new Walnut Street connector that again will extend all the way to downtown Evansville. There's an equal sense of energy surrounding Garvin Park. We have initial concept designs to relocate the shelter house, playground, and basketball courts that were displaced as a result of the Deaconess Aquatic Center. We also have ideas on how to improve the lake, the walking paths, baseball fields, and the Don Mattingly Tribute. The Parks Department has spent the past year talking to stakeholders in the area and have identified even more improvements, including the main fountain. We're very fortunate that the Welburn Baptist Foundation is a partner in these discussions and is highly engaged in developing a plan to re-energize the park and better connect it to the neighborhoods. I'm really proud that one of our city's most recognizable landmarks is getting a long-awaited renovation. The Four Freedoms Monument, which was dedicated in 1976 to commemorate our nation's bicentennial, will be cleaned and the concrete and pavers replaced. This iconic site hosts tributes, memorials, protests, prayer service, too many to mention. I hope you share my pride in knowing that restoration of this important city landmark is right around the corner. Tomorrow is an important day for the Board of Park Commissioners at their meeting and the, they and the public will get a first look at the new five-year master plan for the department. The state of Indiana requires communities to develop these plans to, in order to be eligible for state and federal grants. It's important to note that implementation of many of the recommendations in the plan are already in the, underway, including the addition of a new maintenance crew and the creation of a park-by-park -park improvement plan. Special shout out to Interim Parks Director Steve Schaefer and Deputy Director Danielle Crooks and the entire staff for completing this important and exhaustive effort. Well, among my most frequently asked questions of late, besides what I'm going to be doing when I leave office, is the status of the fifth and main project. Construction costs, interest rate increases, and supply chain shortages, all issues beyond our control, have slowed the, pro the pace of this project, but progress is being made. The scope of the project has changed to include more apartments, less commercial space, while keeping restaurant space on the first floor, along with underground parking and a park at the corner of 4th and Main. I'm pleased to share with you the most recent rendering. The state of Indiana just recently approved the transfer of state incentives to our new developers, so they are now working on the construction drawings. This will take six to eight months. Our team is laser focused on trying to break ground before the end of the year. The medical school campus will begin to take a new look in the next 18 to 24 months. The University of Evansville needs downtown housing for its graduate and undergraduate students, and they need additional classroom space. As a result, a new facility is currently being designed to accommodate UE's needs. It will be located in a portion of the former Deaconess Clinic, while another portion of that old clinic will be raised for future development. This is one of numerous projects for which we'll lay the foundation but will be completed under a new administration. Last year's State of the City included news regarding the riverfront. I told you about our bold new plan called River Vision. The vision imagines 
new traffic pattern on Riverside Drive along with opportunities for new housing, retail, and public spaces from Cherry Street to Court Street. The Evansville Regional Part Economic Partnership and the Downtown EID are working with a downtown planning consultant to assist us with our vision as well as for planning future developments in downtown Mount Vernon and Newburgh. River Vision is one reason, just one, I am so excited about our city's future. Our city's been aiming to the stars and it's been an overwhelming opportunity to have a front row seat to now 12 years of growth, development, community pride, of positive progress. Our success, and I mean every success, is about all of you and every resident. Whether you embody the pioneering spirit of Hugh McGarry or the cheerleading personality of Mayor Benjamin Bossy, our success should be credited to everyone who's come alongside us to dream, to volunteer, to contribute, to celebrate. Friends, the state of our city is bright. It's bright because we are a city of stars, stars that get brighter when we need the greatest light, support, and love, a constellation shining with such intensity as to clearly illuminate our city's future.
It's always a pleasure to highlight our community's future stars. A special thank you to the EVSC High School Honors Choir Director Andrea Drury. Thank you so much. They, they told me they took a big sacrifice to be here today. And I hope that you enjoy a small token of our appreciation, a chocolate key to the city for your amazing support. A special thank you to Tom Libs at Stephen Libs Finer Chocolates for making our chocolate keys to the city. As we conclude today, please know that it has been truly my highest professional honor to serve as our city's 34th mayor. I have enjoyed the convening, the collaborating, the debating, the dreaming. I relish the receptions, the ribbon cuttings, the groundbreakings, and the proclamations. Our objective by leading the way we have was to be the booster Mayor Bossy encouraged. Our time of service in this role is drawing closer to its conclusion, 271 days to be exact. We have much work to start and much work to complete. The new work we'll start will be for a new mayor to oversee. I'm confident that as you have embraced our leadership style and our vision, that you will be equally supportive of my successor when she comes before you next year. May God bless each of you. The good work of the Rotary Club and the city of Evansville. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Winnicky, for your city leadership for over a decade. You are truly a legend, and you'll have big shoes to fill in this upcoming year. On the table, you will see a pen and a children's book. The pens are a gift to you. Please sign the children's book, which will then be given to Vandenberg County CASA. Their mission is to support and promote court-appointed volunteer advocacy in the community and to serve as a child's voice in court. Please make reservations if you plan to attend these upcoming programs. You can make multiple reservations on our website or in the weekly newsletter link. Next week, we have rescheduled the EVSC State of the Schools to May 23rd, and EVSC Athletic Director Andy Owen will be presenting to us next week. On April 18th, members will have the opportunity to vote on the Rotary Santa Run Grant finalists. It takes a village, the No Kill Rescue, their project is Rotary Club of Evansville Capital Project, Ronald McDonald House Charities of the Ohio Valley, their project is Ronald McDonald Care Mobile, and University of Evansville Project, the Rotary Club of Evansville Mental Health Clinic Supervision Lab. On April 25th will be the state of the county. The, it will, will be back down here, and please get your RSVPs in for that by April 18th. My thought for the week, a great city is not to be confounded with a populous one by Aristotle. Enjoy the rest of your day. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>